and we have a lengthy Q&A set up for after this session. And uh, if we're running a little bit behind, we will make up for it, I promise you. Okay, UCL reconstruction variations. This is a cool topic. The reason is when it first started, this operation by Dr. Job, it's undergone some evolution and change because the surgery was hard and technical the first time around and we've done more and more research, learning the anatomy better, the way to approach the ligament and how to fix it. And skills have been changing, evolving, and there's also been innovation and marketing from companies on how to do this operation. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the variations, the options that we have in taking care of them uh, step by step. First is, should you put a camera in if you're gonna do a Tommy John surgery? My booking sheet, with all the equipment that we need, because the way the hospital runs, you have to ask for everything, has arthroscopy on it, and it drives the staff crazy, because right before we start the surgery, they say, are you gonna scope? And if I say yes, everybody's got a frown. If I say no, they're like, yeah, good, we're gonna move through this quickly. Arthroscopy, when patients say, you do an arthroscopy, outside of a ligament, patients in the family always say, how did the UCL look? And you say, I, I can't tell you how it looked, because with the scope, you can't see the ligament. You might be able to see some lining of it, but you really can't see it with the scope, but you can assess laxity, just like a stress view, and see if the joint is opening up. But really, it's important for loose bodies impingement and synovitis. This is what it looks like if you're looking at the ulnar humeral joint, stress view, like if you were gonna take an X-ray, or now more commonly an ultrasound, you can see it open up. And there was a time when people would do arthroscopy and decide based on this if they were gonna continue and go forward with the reconstruction. I think at this point in time, most people are committed to the reconstruction ahead of time. Now it's sometimes a question at the time of surgery, is it gonna be a reconstruction or a repair? This is what it's really good for. You take that loose thing out in the back that we heard about and they got a ligament. This is what it looks like if you're going to do this. You can do it in a lateral, supine. This happens to be supine because we're gonna do a ligament afterwards. You suspend the arm, you put the camera in, you can take the loose piece out, and then you can then go and convert to your open approach, very easily put it on a hand table and do your reconstruction. So as a choice, a variation, arthroscopy is a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe you get additional information on the ligament. The worst is when you're doing an isolated posterior impingement and you find out they're a little loose. That's a little bit uncomfortable but really you can treat posterior impingement. So we'll show some cases because not every posterior impingement lesion has to be fixed every time if you're doing a Tommy John. Okay, let's talk about approach. How do we get to the ligament? There's differences. You can take the tendon down. That's historical. We don't really do that anymore. This is a picture of Dr. Job's technique. Look at all the sutures trying to put that thing back. As we showed in the anatomy video, you can elevate it Dr. Andrews popularized that, or you can split it, and we showed that in the video. Here's what we know, the HITS data again. This is about to be published. There is no difference in return to play, return to sport, and Major League Baseball if you had either a elevate or a split. So that's good to know. Doesn't matter, maybe. And then we talked so much about how important the flexor mass is. Well, if you're doing different things to that flexor mass, is there a chance you could have different problems down the road? Turns out there's no different in forearm injuries independent of whatever choice you did, elevate or split. So that's reassuring. Any way you want on the flexor, elevate or split. All right, let's go over the ulnar nerve. We had a few questions about this. Jeff gave us a great presentation. This kid said my elbow popped. He's about 14. He's got a subluxing ulnar nerve. About 16% of the population have a nerve that subluxes. Very important to know if it subluxes if you're gonna put a camera in because you put a camera in through the front right where it may be sitting if it's subluxed and you could cause an ulnar nerve injury. So whether we're going to do something to the ulnar nerve depends on whether it subluxes. Most of us would agree if it subluxes, we're gonna fix it in an anterior position. If you have neuritis, that's gonna be controversial. If you have neuropathy, probably gonna do a transposition. So there is surgeon preference here. And this thing at the end, that last word, I would say 10 years ago, I didn't know what this is. Anconeus epitrochlearis. I know you guys are all saying it to yourself underneath, not loud, because it it's looks like a hard word to pronounce. This is what it is. There's a accessory muscle that some people have that go I was told the pointer is underneath. All you have to do is look for it. 
This is the muscle. Look, it goes from the epicondyle to the ulna. Not everybody has it, and it's dynamic. It makes uh, tension, and you could, you could even see it here. It looks like it could be compressing the ulna nerve. So if you have that, it's not unusual to get ulnar neuritis, and you may want to do transposition in that setting. Okay, this kid, he had Tommy John surgery in another city. He took the train to come see us because he's eight months from the surgery, and his fingers are getting more and more numb, and his fingers are starting to flex, especially the fourth and fifth, and he's got weakness in his hand, and it's getting clumsy, and his doctor keeps saying, you're not ready to throw. Come back and see me in another month, and then maybe you're ready to throw. He's got a bad ulnar nerve after the surgery. Unfortunately, this could happen. And so we, uh, we did do an ulnar nerve transposition, and maybe his nerve would have come back without it, but it was just getting too long and too late, and it was time to do something about it. What do we know about ulnar nerve complications? This is a systematic review, uh, available online, going to be in print soon. All the Tommy John surgeries that have been reported in the literature, 12% of them had an ulnar nerve problem. Most of them are transient. They do come back different than that last patient but it happens more often when you do an obligatory transposition or if you handle the nerve. So as Jeff said, compared to other nerves, the only nerve you can manipulate, but it still gets angry afterwards compared to not handling the ulnar nerve. So less complication rate or less ulnar nerve problems if you leave the nerve alone. So ulnar nerve transposition, when we look at the data of all professional athletes, is more likely to happen if you do the modified Job technique. That's the Andrews technique. Andrews does so much of this surgery at the major league level that he is probably personally skewing this data. But as we said, there is no correlation with return to play or return to sport, whether you elevate the muscle or if you do this obligatory ulnar nerve transposition. And this is independent of all the other factors. The reviewer of this paper sent it back and said, you got to really factor in the other factors to tell us there's no problem with the ulnar nerve. So we got fancy with the statistics. OK, ulnar nerve in summary. It's controversial whether you're going to transpose it or not. It's another one. Let's get some experts up on the bar stools, and we'll find out what their approach is. All right, we had a question about graph source. Let's go into it a little bit more detail. Palmaris is absent 20% of the time, so it's not there. and I'll. I'll say this humbly, because I've done a lot of cadaver work. Actually, I showed you guys cadaver work, so you guys believe me. We've done cadaver work and tested the strength of elbows and operating so quickly on cadavers to try and get the thing dissected and ready to get in the jig to test the strength of the ligament. There was a cadaver that did not have a palmaris, and I harvested the median nerve on a cadaver. I'm going to say that again, on a cadaver, where I'm filmed. It was on a cadaver. It's on a cadaver. So it's very humbling. If somebody does not have a, you have to check the Palmaris. In fact, I like to have two people check it. My staff, Frank checks it. Fiona checks it. My staff check it, and so do I. Because if they don't have a Palmaris or I'm in misinterpreting the Palmaris, the thing right underneath it when it's not there is the median nerve. OK, gracilis, we already talked about it. It's larger, it's bigger, it's stronger, maybe too big. Ligament is ossified. We'll show you cases of that. Or revision, gracilis is go-to. Which leg will be interesting. And then allograft. Most people don't like allograft, but there are some people who have reported that it is OK to use. On the lateral ligament, it's used primarily. If you have a lateral outside ligament, mostly from dislocating your elbow type of thing, not in throwers, they use allograft. So why not on the inside? I'm going to tell you why. This ligament is under so much stress. If it's allograft, it gets treated, it's frozen, it gets irradiated uh, much of the time. If there is one level of compromise to the potential of this player coming back, I'm not interested. By the way, the Palmaris is available. It's only absent 20% of the time, so let's use it. Somebody, not in this room, advocates toe extensors. They happen to be a foot surgeon. It's a viable tendon, doesn't do anything to the foot. I just, I don't operate on the foot, so I wouldn't use it. We're going to talk about ipsilateral, contralateral. Here we go. Brandon Erickson is at it again. He's at it again. He did it. 52 Major League Baseball team orthopedic surgeons were surveyed. He got me at the last meeting. He said, I need two minutes of your time, and he got me, and I was part of the survey. 77% of Major League Baseball team physicians did the survey. And which leg, if you're taking a gracilis, would you harvest from, the drive leg or the land leg? It's actually fun to talk about. Is it the drive leg? I have my own opinions. But it looks like most people would take it from the land leg because there's so much emphasis on drive. You got to drive to home plate. That's how you get your momentum. And you don't want to 
corrupt that ability to drive the home plate. I actually take it from the land leg for two reasons. It's easier in my operating room because I don't have these big, enormous rooms, and it's tight. And ipsilateral is easier. And also, land leg, land leg, I see that they have more patellar tendonitis and pes bursitis on their land leg. It's under a lot of stress. And the gracilis comes around. So I take it from the drive leg, haven't seen any problems with it. Controversial, let's ask experts on the bar stool. Okay, here's tunnel creation, location, and size. This is something that uh, is the technical part. This is the, this is the surgical part. This is a, from a book that is really a book that many people have on their shelf that is a instruction on how to do surgery and it describes how to do ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. And I look at this and I see their ulnar bone bridge. This is an example of how to do it. Those holes that you see there are described as four millimeters. There's a four millimeter hole. There's a four millimeter hole. This bone bridge, I estimate probably about four millimeters. Maybe it's five. It doesn't look that big and I'm worried about it because the bone uh, can fracture or you get a stress reaction. But this is when you describe, look at the techniques when it's written up and this is what they say for bone bridge, this is what they say they get. That four millimeter thing, maybe five, is being reported as getting 20 millimeters. I don't get 20 millimeters. That's what they, that's what we report. It sounds satisfying. We'll talk about the humeral tunnel length. This is George's work, uh, George is here. And uh, he gets 25 millimeters, he goes way up, this is on the humeral side. It's drilling a depth of tunnel, I'll show you what that means. But getting adequate depth is another feature of this. So what do I mean by uh, getting a bone bridge that's adequate? This is the split. And these are the two tunnels being drilled next to each other. This is a 3.5 drill, and we connect it with the curette. So we're trying to get adequate bone bridge so this thing won't break and fracture. But I really don't think we're, we're getting as big as we would uh, indicate in our reports. This is what docking looks like. Job, when he first started, wrapped this around through bigger holes here, and then he weaved it all around as a figure of eight. And sometimes it's done with suturing up here the graft. This is the docking technique. You suture the graft limbs, you deliver it in the tunnel, and then you get to tie over this bone bridge. This is what it looks like. The graft limbs have to be the right length, and the longer the bone tunnel, the more healing and the easier this is going to be. I can tell you this is satisfying when you do this. In fact, between you and I, sometimes I take it out and I do it again. <laughs> and then you tie over the bone bridge. This is what I mean by the technical aspects. When everything's going beautiful, you got this big long tunnel, 20 millimeters, 15, maybe 25, and you get these exit tunnels right at the end. Perfect. This is what could happen if you have a short tunnel. Then you gotta get, you don't have a lot of tolerance and you may get a loose graft and then it, it hits the end of the tunnel and the thing's loose. And then what you do? That's one of my favorite questions to ask a fellow, what do you do now? because you need a plan on how to deal with that. And even if you have a long tunnel, when you create the exit tunnels, you're actually not seeing inside where the tunnel goes. You may feel like you got this magic tunnel, you may have this situation. So we did some CT scan work, and we wanted to find the best location for the tunnels. It's actually getting more and more important because tunnel location, if it's not perfect in the right spot, probably is a cause of failure, early failure too. Guy comes back and then his elbow doesn't work. So how do we get be better at that? Here, many people in the room on the faculty are involved in creating instrumentation so that when we expose the ligament, flexor split here, and then we got exposure, we can put in guides and get a good bone bridge and make sure that it's going to work out properly. I'll tell you this, I had somebody call me up and he said, um, I fractured the bone bridge and I used the guide. I don't know what to say. I actually don't use the guide that often because there's so much sublime tubercle variation that the guide can throw you off a little bit. So I actually don't use the guide that often, but it's designed to make sure that, uh, to try to help you get out of trouble. And then here's a uh, more instrumentation where you can drill at the inferior epicondyle right at the right spot. And then here's a clever jig. It's in the back room uh, during the break. You can visit and look at it so that you can get those connecting tunnels for either a weave the graph around or do your docking technique and be perfect with the tunnel length 
and then you could even have these uh, instruments available in a kit to help you pass. This is the Major League Baseball data. Docking is getting more popular. So more people are doing that technique that we just showed. There's another way to look at it. Red is docking, red's going up, and modified job to weave it around is green, so it tends to be going down. Okay, a couple other technical variations, because we have different situations that we want to deal with. First, as we showed, we can tie over a bone bridge. If we have a problem with a bone bridge or something breaks or something happens, the backup is using things like buttons, cortical button, very strong. We use it in all different areas of uh, tendon surgery, and we can use it for only collateral ligament surgery, especially if there's bad bone or uh, bad prior tunnels. Here's an example. He had a, a reconstruction and it retore. So we make this hole in the sublime tubercle. He needed his ulnar nerve managed. And then here's his tunnel. And then we can take a pin, pass it across, and have a button like this that we can tension. And then we get fixation with a cortical button on the far side. It is probably the strongest fixation right here. And we don't even need a bone bridge. OK, and then one last case. This kid spends a full year recovering from his surgery. In his first game back, he feels a pop. And then he gets an x-ray and an MRI scan and it shows, here's his x-ray, something about that tunnel that doesn't look great. But here's his MRI scan. As Hollis told us, bright is bad and is acute, so this doesn't look good. And so this uh, unfortunately failed. Here's a button in play here because prior tunnels and we got to make new tunnels and all kinds of things, we want to use a button to help with the fixation. So let's talk about number of graft strands and then we're going to finish up. Players are so knowledgeable now, they ask after the surgery, how many strands did you get? And sometimes a little nervous, like going into it. I'm like, I better get enough strands for this guy. He's expecting all the strands. You can do a, showed you a two-strand graft before. It was two going in. You can do a three-strand graft. You have all this length of ligament. You don't have to remove this. And George, this is his way to go technique. I think Tom mentioned it too, that he used a quadruple strand and we can talk about their techniques. But you can take this and you can pass it through the tunnel again. And so you get a three strand graft. And in fact, posterior to me seems important. So I leave extra in the posterior band because that's the one that's tight when you're in this position. That's the one where you're in a cocking phase. How about four strands? Love it. Look, we got four strands. We went all the way around, we came all the way back, and now we can put this in, and now we have four strands. So when I see him in the holding area or the uh, post-anesthesia care unit, and they say, how many strands did you get? If I say four, I leave it that. that. If I unfortunately got two, I always tell them it's the biggest two I've ever seen. Okay, controversial. We're going to ask the experts on how many strands they use. We got a break. I'm going to check my time.